All right, guys, today we're going to be looking at a pile of leather. What we're actually going to be doing is ranking my short list. Now, what I mean by a short list is in a video I did not so long ago, I talked about my top knives, the knives that uh, spend the majority of time on my body when I go out to do different bushcrafting, wilderness, wild camping kinds of tasks. And today I thought it would be even more fun to try to rank these knives in most likely to least likely, or probably starting out with least likely to most likely to carry. So as always guys, please don't forget to comment, like, share, subscribe, check out the Patreon, the Instagram, all the behind the, behind the scenes stuff. The support is very much appreciated. Okay, now let's jump into it. So before I get into it, I will say, like I said, this video is inspired off my short list. And what I mean by my short list is I own a plethora of different knives for different tasks, of course, as well. But these are the handful of knives, maybe more than handful of knives that spend the majority of time either being carried, being fielded and being used. So that is kind of the preference or so that's kind of uh, where we're coming at with this. So all of these knives do see a lot of field time, irregardless to their placement on this list. However, the first First one I'll start off with is the Topps Fieldcraft. Now, the reason why this one is my probably my least carried or my least likely to carry is primarily due to the fact that one, it is a larger knife, and I have kind of, as I have progressed in my bushcrafting, I tend to veer away from larger knives in bushcrafting. And this is one of my original bushcrafting knives, one of the first. Uh, you know, I kind of got my uh, more uh, clipper companions. You know, the kind of fun early beginner knives and when I wanted a more serious knife this is the one I stepped up to and so in the beginning I ran larger knives like this one and the next one we'll talk about but I just don't run them as frequently in addition to that I'm not the largest fan of the differentially heat treated blade so that makes it very hard to strike ferro rods off the spine and they really want you to use this horrible shango notch on the bottom that's uh, definitely a hard pass from me so when it comes to it, it's not quite as capable as some of the other knives on the list, and it's just a little bit larger than I like. However, I will say it is also incredibly comfortable to hold and to use for long periods of time for doing things like carving, notching, and uh, those types of craft-driven craft tasks. Okay, next one up on the list for least likely to carry, but slightly more likely to carry than the tops. Fieldcraft is going to be the BRK or Bark River Knives Aurora. And the Aurora for me is once again a knife that's not as likely to be carried because of its larger size. So I'll pop this guy out here. You guys can see there it is smaller than the Topps Fieldcraft, but still pretty darn big. So once again, uh, the Aurora has a similar story. When I got more experienced and wanted to kind of move on to the next knife, my next knife from the Topps Fieldcraft was the Aurora and so while I still really do like this knife and it is incredibly comfortable it's hard to explain uh, how well contoured the uh, kind of coke bottle shaped handle is uh, I just don't like the size overall and the other thing with the Aurora especially the A2 models like this one the tip due to the convex grind and it's no support due to or no support to the tip it makes the tip very very fragile so it is prone to breakage so those are the couple of reasons why i dislike the aurora and why it doesn't seem see as much carry time but it is still an incredibly good knife and for things like game processing it's actually very well uh very well suited to that because of its very thin tip Next one up on the list is the SE3. And I'm trying to place these as sole knives if I'm not gonna be running anything else because I feel like I run the SE a lot with other blades because it is so lightweight and just so thin. But that's kind of part of the reason why I don't like running it by itself. It's thin nature, doesn't necessarily make it a weak knife, but as I've mentioned in other videos, because it is so thin when you want to do things like batoning or processing of wood, it is, a little bit more time consuming because it's so thin it doesn't really splay apart wood it doesn't really break wood apart uh, when you do things like batoning so while it is perfectly tough and you won't break this knife i can guarantee that um, it's just a little bit little bit 
uh, too thin and a little bit lacking in the handle as well, which once again is kind of one of the things I like about it in certain aspects because it is so thin and so minimal and easy to carry. But at the same time too, it is not always the most comfortable to hold, especially with the jimping on the spine because the spine of this blade is so thin, the jimping really does feel quite severe. So that is why it does not see as much time. However, it is one of my favorite, more favorited knives for game processing and natural resource processing because of its full flat grind and thin blade stock. Okay, let's see what's next up on the list. I think the next one is going to be the Falkneven F1. Now the Falkneven F1 actually kind of moves up a few tiers when it comes to the winter or cold weather because it is a lot more temperature neutral in the handle. And of course it is full tang, but you don't feel or have to hold that cold tang in the winter. And some people might wonder why, you know, uh, that would be really an issue in the winter. And that is because oftentimes in cold weather, as you guys have probably seen with my channel, a lot of times what I do is I wear very thick heavy duty mittens and I'll wear mittens when I'm generally traveling or traversing in the, the wild and then when it comes to doing things like feather sticking or feather sticking or you know processing of different uh or like carving, feather sticking, processing foods, whatever, I'll take my mittens off and just have my bare hands. And usually that's not really an issue because my hands are so warm from my mittens that I can take them in and out of my mittens. And of course my mittens have like little uh, like leashes, so to speak, uh, or lanyards, and you can just put them on and take them off as need be. So anyways, uh, it is nice to have a fully rubberized handle in those types of situations because then you're not dealing with feeling any cold tang and so I would say it definitely gets carried a lot more in the winter, but especially in the summer, this knife is actually kind of on the opposite end of the spectrum from the SE. It's a little bit too thick for my preferences. And you'll notice that while I do like convex grinds, I don't love convex grinds because when you cut with them, especially when you're doing things like notching and carving and feather sticking, um, you kind of have to change the way that you hold the knife so that you're getting proper, uh, like, so that the edge is biting but not biting too much so that the edge is biting but not biting too much I guess is the best way to put it in addition to that too I'm also not the biggest fan of its sheath setup uh, it's kind of not optimal to carry so that's another reason why I don't love love it but that's why it's placing a little bit lower on the list Okay, next one up on the list is actually kind of a surprise because it is a larger knife and it's the only larger knife that is gonna place this high and that is the Battle Horse Knives Battle Lore. Now, part of the reason why it places so high up on the list is because I really do love the wood lore, bush lore, craft lore, whatever you want to say, kind of a lore knife style. And this is like the Battle Lore. So it has that lore styled blade kind of you know swooping um, spear point to it. And the big thing that I, I really love about this knife is that it is you know around the same size as say the aurora i think it's actually a little bit bigger uh maybe not maybe, maybe it's about the same size but anyways it's about the same size as the brk aurora so it is a larger knife for me but it does a really good job at because of its blade shape and design at being a smaller knife that you can really use for a lot of fine detailed um, work. In addition to that too, it has an eighth of an inch stock of 01 tool steel. So it's a little bit on the thinner side, kind of nearing that one tenth of an inch that the SC has, but it's still thick enough to do a good job at things like batoning and hard use. And uh, overall, like I said, it just, it's one of those knives, it's hard to explain that it is a larger knife, but feels in use and in hand like a smaller knife. In addition, it has a really nice kind of larger or wider Scandinavian grind that helps it cut and be very, very slicey, digs deep into wood. And in fact, this is one of my knives that I prefer for people when I'm training them to do bush crafting tasks. This is definitely one of those knives that if I trust that they're not gonna do anything crazy, uh, or if I know that they are reasonably skilled with knives, I'll usually have them start with the battle lore because it is a very uh, easy knife to get good results. Okay, next one up on the list is the 3DK or Three Dog Knives MAK. Now, this one isn't quite in the top three, 
just because of a few reasons. The first one for me is the jimping. I'm not a huge fan of it. And uh, of course, any type of jimping does make a knife uncomfortable for prolonged periods of time. However, it does have some redeeming qualities. It does have uh, cuts in the handle so that you can pinch grip it like this. So if you're trying to do like a chest lever or if you're trying to take a cut at a you know kind of a right angle or a more difficult uh, angle, especially with game processing, having those areas milled out on the handle for a pinch grip is very nice. So it does have some redeeming qualities with its ergonomics. The other thing I kind of dislike ergonomically is that this knife is built to be more tough, more robust and kind of hardcore. So, so you have these kind of flared areas out here and here where there is no handle support. So let's just say with Another knife we'll talk about in a little bit. You know, there is no exposed steel. Everything has a handle or everything has handle covering it. And what that ultimately means is when you have just like a protrusion of steel, it ends up becoming a hot spot because that there's no thickness. There's not as much taper or contour to it to make it comfortable. So that's why I kind of dislike the handle on this one. Outside of that though, the blade itself is actually very good. And uh, once again, in that just right kind of size, just right kind of thickness for 530 seconds and so it's thick enough to not be too thin but it's also not overly tanky or overly thick so that, those are the reasons why it doesn't quite make it into the top three but the MAK is still a very good knife okay now on to the top three now there's going to be a lot of uh, homogeny between these three and that's kind of on purpose and that's because as a knife person uh, or as a knife collector i think anyone will find themselves kind of in a space where you know they know what they like the most and so the first one on my list is going to be the legome now the legome is also in the top three partly due to its sentimental reasons for having close sentimental or close relations in design elements with um, Morris Kohansky, really kind of one of the originators and pioneers of bushcrafting as developing as a skill trait. And uh, this of course is based off of his Skookum knife where it has a flowing belly, a kind of, you know, hand width palm or palm width uh, blade length and those kind of attributes. And if you don't know what I mean, in his book, Bushcraft, Morris Kohansky outlines the Skookum bush tool that he kind of uh, developed for students of his classes and so while this is not one of those knives this is inspired by those specifications and design requirements so uh, that is the legome and it is an incredibly so outside of those kind of design uh, purposes and background it is an incredibly comfortable knife once again it has a very basic handle, but this handle has no hot spots on it whatsoever. It is absolutely contoured, smooth. Everywhere you can touch on this handle is just really, really comfy. And it flares up nicely in the palm. It has a great palm swell. And so when it comes to doing things like carving, crafting, notching, feather sticking, um, it is just incredibly comfy to hold for hours. It might not be the most grippy of the bunch, but it is very comfy and it is hard to complain about the uh, the ergonomics of it. It's very basic, like I said, but yet super, super comfy. In addition to that too, it is an eighth of an inch thick, so a little bit on the thinner side, but it is a one tool steel, so it's totally robust and tough. And it has a really nice, um, and it has an extremely well done Scandinavian grind that really helps with its cutting abilities and performance as a whole. So overall, the Legome I think is actually a really fitting name for this knife because it's a very basic, very simple, very you know nonchalant kind of blade that doesn't really stand out, doesn't really look crazy, uh, unlike some of the others, but yet its performance is just undeniable. That, so that is the Legome. And of course, I have mine in orange G10 to match Morse Kohansky's. Okay, next one up on the list, and this is a pretty close tie between one and two, or number one and two, but the next one is going to be the JBK Layman. Now, the things that I really like about the JBK Layman are, once again, it's 530 seconds, seven inch thick, on the spine and towards the core. Of course, this is a tapered tang, so it does thin out both front and back or top and bottom uh, or going towards the tip and the end of the blade, however you'd like to call that. But it is 
very strong, very robust for doing more industrial tasks, such as batoning and being more hard on the knife. But it also does have a convex grind with a bevel to be very thin, very slicey. And because of its nature with the tapered tang and all of that, it is also very, very lightweight. And so this one is, like I said, one of my more often carried because it's super tough, but it's super lightweight and it's very, very comfy in the handle. The handle is super well contoured and of course this is a semi-custom, maybe even custom depending on how you would uh, you know, phrase it. And so it is very well made and super, super comfortable in the hand and cannot complain at all. Similar to the Legome, similar to the BRK Bushcrafter we're going to talk about here in just a second. Uh, it is just super, super contoured and comfortable to hang on to. And I think there's nothing that makes a knife more desirable to use than to just have a simple blade shape that is very effective and a super comfortable squared away um, ergonomic handle. Okay, last one up on the list is going to be the BRK Bushcrafter. As I'm sure it does not surprise many people, the BRK Bushcrafter is and has been my go-to all-around bushcrafting knife for many, many years. And uh, the first one I got was back in 2014. And ever since 2014, I've really been carrying the BRK Bushcrafter pretty reliably. Of course, like I said, there are other knives in the collection that I do carry, but the BRK Bushcrafter was the knife that I moved on to after the BRK Aurora, and I really have not looked back since. And once again, I do enjoy using some larger knives, but as far as this blade goes, it's made out of CPM 3V, so it is incredibly tough and durable, very hard to break. It is also 5 30 seconds of an inch thick, so it's a bit on the thick side, you know, I find 530 seconds to be kind of that Goldilocks thickness where it's not too thick, not too thin. It's just right to be able to handle a lot of severe abuse, but also be thin and agile enough to do things like more delicate tasks, such as processing like skinning game animals, um, processing natural resources, carving, notching, feather sticking, all of the things that we normally do. So the BRK Bushcrafter is just incredibly hard to go wrong with. And uh, my both of mine have served me very well. I did uh, sell my first one, unfortunately, which is what prompted me to buy another one. But either generation or both of them are incredible knives. Now, uh, these are original Bushcrafters. Uh, BRK does make the 2.0, which is a larger version of this. They also make the Bushcrafter Ultralight, which is a thinner version of this. I have never felt the need to really go for anything larger. Once again, definitely don't want to go with a larger knife because I like this size a lot. And I don't really need that thinner size because I think that the 530 seconds is really just perfect. So anyways, that is the final knife and the number one knife for ranking my go-to knife collection. Now, like I said in the beginning of this video, it doesn't necessarily mean that the ones at the bottom of the list are bad knives. I certainly carry all of these knives, like every one of them on a fairly regular basis when I'm out in woods. So I do carry them and alternate. It's just which one am I most likely to go with and which one excites me the most to carry usually are some of like the top five of these. So anyways, guys, hopefully you enjoyed the video. As always, God bless and I'm out.